first question is just why? Why the sale? Well, you know, last fall our stock started hitting some choppy waters. And, you know, while the stock price of a public company is not really important in the near term, um, after a while it really kind of starts wearing on the company. And uh, we, uh, when that happened, multiple uh, potential acquirers reached out to us and said, hey, look, you know, you don't have to be out there in those stormy waters, you know, come and be part of us and you could have a more nurturing environment where you can advance the future of the company. And oh, by the way, we think of that MindBody is a, a marvelous company. And uh, so when we started receiving those, those inquiries in, in October, the board of directors got together and we decided, you know what, I think it's, th it's the best thing for the business to at least talk to those people. And so we agreed to hire an advisor, um, an investment banker, which is what you do when you're going to be talking to potential inquirers, because they help sort of quarterback that. Um, it's kind of like hiring a broker if you're going to sell your house and, uh, or considering selling your house. And so we spoke to multiple potential acquirers in November and December. There are two kinds. The first kind are private equity firms, which interestingly are pooling together money from some of the same people that put money into the public equity funds. It's just a different way of investing money. And uh, we also spoke to strategic acquirer potentials. And these are large companies, uh, often very well-known companies that people know, and I of course can't say who they are who were seriously interested in us as well. And Vista Equity Partners just came forward with a very compelling offer and they did it quickly. Because one thing I knew for sure was that we weren't going to be hanging our shingle out there for a long period of time. We were going to find out if there's any interest in us, then we'll, we'll entertain very compelling offers. They would have to be significantly higher than where our stock is trading at. And if not, it's all good, we'll just go back to operating as a public company and we'll just re remain that way. So Vista came through with uh, an offer the week before Christmas. Um, we pushed back, of course, and we up they upped that offer. Pretty clear to us that if we didn't take the offer at the time, it probably still wouldn't be there in January. Uh, and so we, we decided on December 23rd to go forward. So that means we announced it on Christmas Eve. So, I mean, you seem a little bit excited about this, obviously, yeah. uh, with the timing of it. But let's take a step back. Tell me about the beginnings of this company, and I want to get to where you are, you know, and how, and how you kind of fit in with this sale. So, yeah, know, the briefest history of Sure. So, Blake Beltram and I started this company in late 2000 in my garage uh, in the Arbors up here off of Tank Farm Road. In fact, it was uh, Purple Sage Lane is where we started. And uh, we ran the company in my garage and his kitchen in Glendale down in Southern California for the first three years. And our original product was a installed software that ran on your PC to run your fitness studio. Um, and also we started going into spas as well. So why fitness studios? We saw this emerging market of boutique wellness which took the form of mainly of fitness and spa and also something called integrative health. These are these new practices, well they're not new practices, they're very old practices but new to the US like Ayurveda, uh, Chinese med medicine, acupuncture. And we realized that they had very distinct business needs and that nobody had built tools to help them run their rather complicated businesses more easily. So we saw an, under, uh, a, a, an underser underserved market that we felt was going to grow and we realized there was also a challenge they face of how do they get more customers in the door. So we had this early vision of creating a marketplace, meaning that a place where people could come to find uh, the kinds of services and, and experiences that would help them live healthier, happier lives. So look what this has grown into all by your doing, and you obviously hit on a great idea, and you've got this huge campus here. Yeah. So how much of this is your baby, and how scary if if that's the right word, yeah. to give it away to somebody else. Well, um, it, it does feel like my baby in some ways, but I have to say, I didn't build this alone. This is the result of the efforts of thousands of people 
uh, and 2,000 of whom work for MindBody today. But there are people that were here in their early years that have gone on to other things in their careers. There are investors who have uh, bet their hard-earned money on us. I mean, in the early years, these were, these were angel investors. Uh, or very early, early years, it was my family uh, and a few friends. Um, I personally took out a second on my house with three kids uh, and not a whole lot of net worth and risked most of my net worth on this company in 2001 through 2003. And so I have, I, I knew all along, my hope was to create something that was much bigger than me. That's why my name's not on it. It's not about me. I wanted something that would sustain for generations, that would do something that really mattered for the world. That's what's kept me engaged for 20 years. And Blake feels exactly the same way. So my control of this business ended a very long time ago. The minute that we accepted venture capital money, when we asked people to bet millions of dollars on our vision and our plans, that's when you as an entrepreneur stop controlling the story. Now there's rare cases where entrepreneurs can retain control, and, um, but not in most cases. So for tech entrepreneurs, you literally, you're having to uh, let go of the baby pretty early. And of course, most of those investors want the founders to be in the game. They want the founders fully engaged. And they're typically betting on the company and the people who started it. So I've always said to our investors and to our various board directors, I love the company more than I do my job and I'll stick around as long as you believe I'm the right person to run the company and they've kept saying I'm the right person. So with the sale to Vista Partners, of course we couldn't have any conversations about whether I was gonna continue as CEO. It certainly felt like they wanted me to, to continue but we were not allowed to have any conversations about that, and certainly no conversations about what my compensation might be. Uh, uh, I had to, it's a moment of kind of a leap of faith to say, this is the right thing for the company. If they decide somebody else needs to run it, it'll probably be for the right reasons. You know, because I'm a guy who started a company in my garage, and today I have 2,000 uh, employees and 65,000 customers, and we're gonna do north of 300 million in revenue this year. Nobody ever taught me how to do that. This has been a continuous learning stretch for two decades. And, well, I just met with them yesterday. They, uh, several Vista Equity Partner leaders came to our site here. Uh, they spent all day in meetings with me and, and other senior leaders in the company. They very strongly want me to stay on as CEO. And effectively, the only thing that's changed is that I have a new board of directors um, and I have effectively one owner. There will also be a portion of the company set aside for em employees to also receive ownership in the business, very similar to how we operated before we went public. And so for most MindBody team members, very little has changed. What, what has changed is that we can return our focus to a more longer term view and not be so concerned about how this quarter's numbers work. Being public is, has a number of advantages and for us it gave us access to capital that we could not have easily accessed if we had remained a venture backed company. It allowed us to give exits to the early investors you know, who after several years are like, wow you're doing great and I kinda like to get my money now. You know, that's what investors do. And it, it expanded our brand. We became a much more well-known company when we went public. And it also applies certain constraints on the business. You, you inevitably start talking about, you know, this quarter you were just, a, you, uh, in Q3 of 2018, the street expected us to do $64 million in revenue. Instead, we only did 63.8. And because of that, our stock lost hundreds of millions of dollars of value. It's kind of crazy. It, it's kind of insane. And so that inevitably causes, as much as you want to maintain a long-term view, the public CEO and, and the other senior leaders have to be looking at, well, wait a minute, how's it going to look this quarter if we make this necessary investment? Is that going to degrade our numbers? Are we going to get punished by the market? I really do think, you know, there's talk about changing these earnings cycles for public companies. I think there might be some wisdom in that having experienced it firsthand for four years. So they bought all of the, the stock? For all of it. So, I mean, there, so there isn't, it's not publicly traded anymore, it's the same? 
That's correct. That's correct. So that's why the majority of the shareholder, um, the shareholder votes had to vote for the deal for it to pass. And that happened on uh, Valentine's Day. So we announced on Christmas Eve, we did the vote on Valentine's Day, February 14th, and we closed on February 15th. So when it was a publicly traded company, you obviously own stock and you were still a portion owner of the company. That's right. And you are no longer an owner of the company now. Um, the vast majority of my ownership I have sold. That's right. Um, and that's the proceeds, you know, that people talk about. Yeah, it's the proceeds of the company that I built, you know, and I'm very fortunate that it worked out well. Um, but also includes the money I put in and, and the sweat equity I put in for across decades. Now, what I do have is some unvested uh, stock options that I, I might be able to roll into the, the continued ownership. I'd like to. Um, that's actually still being determined right now. And um, uh, they also will establish an equity pool to provide new incentives to to team members at but, my body. But you did take a risk in the fact that you will, you do, you are giving up a lot of control that you had before in each of these steps, you've given up more and more control. That's right, every step along the way, it's, and it is kind of analogous, you know, you talk about being my baby. Um, we who are parents, what happens in the process of, of raising a child? You are in sequence letting go of control. I mean, when they're like this, you control them 100%. Well, by the time they're 13, you don't control them quite so much anymore. And by the time they're 18, they're adults. And I think metaphorically, this is the vision of, a, of an entrepreneur. There are some entrepreneurs who just want to control it, their whole journey. It's never been my nature. Uh, again, my role as CEO uh, is far less important to me than the company itself. And I think by keeping it that way, that's part of the reason why we've gotten this far. I think there's a trap for entrepreneurs, and particularly those who are successful, that their own egos get wrapped up in the business. And oftentimes they're clinging on to it very tightly because they can't emotionally detach. And you have to detach at some point. Otherwise it'll just eat you up, or it just becomes the sum total of who you are. And, and while this is has become my life's work, it's not the sum total of who I am. I have a family, I have a wife and kids that I adore, I have other things that I care about, I'm involved in the community, uh, I've been involved in the Chamber of Commerce, the Center of Inno Innovation Entrepreneurship, uh, um, I love mentoring and investing in startups, and I want to be able to do other things. So I am an employee of the company just like everyone else as a CEO, that's been true for many years, and I will serve at the pleasure of the Board of Directors. That Board of Directors just told me yesterday, we want you around, Rick. We love what you're doing, and we want to help you succeed. As, as a CEO, you know, it's been said it's a lonely job. It is a very lonely job, because at the end of the day, all these decisions, all the bucks stop here. You've got to make very hard decisions doing something that you've never done before in precisely this way. And this company is very unusual, and what we're attempting to do in the world is unprecedented in many ways. And uh, the board of directors could provide advice and we can hire consultants or we go out and hire experienced leaders from outside to help us. At the end of the day, it all comes down to, Rick, what do you want to do? Are you going to go left or are you going to go right? Now I have a group of really seasoned software leaders. And within the Vista organization, over 300 seasoned software executives that have seen multiple different companies and they call it being part of the Vista family. And the first time I heard the Vista family, I was like, really? That's a little cheesy. Actually, no, it feels like a family. They really care about each other. It's a support network. And uh, so I feel much more supported now and, uh, and re-energized because a lot of the, the, the sticky challenges that we've been having around, you know, we acquired other companies. Last year was a big year for acquisitions for us. And it's very complex melding these teams together and now the, the senior leadership of the company, we have the support of people that know a lot about how to buy and integrate software companies. So that feels really good. But there's a lot of concern, obviously, that, that uh, your employees raise. And, and you've really developed this sort of family atmosphere here in the yeah. company as well. And, and uh, you know, that's been a big part of mind body. But what about the risk of employee layoffs? Well, we have no plans for employee layoffs. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We are probably, we are not probably, we are going to accelerate our hiring. We already had significant hiring planned. And all you have to do is go to our website. You'll see how many jobs we have open right now. Everyone, 
go look at the website. There are jobs okay. there here in San Luis Obispo and in almost every other office. Uh, we will most likely be accelerating hiring in two very distinct areas. Number one is product and technology. We've got a lot of work to do to optimize the products that we have, to uh, modernize them, to prepare them for the next stage of our growth, and to provide new services to our customers and new ways for consumers to engage with our customers. The customers are the small the businesses we serve and the consumers is all the rest of us. Um, and in sales and marketing, because we have 65,000 businesses running on our platform, well there's over 300,000 businesses that we've identified who could benefit from our software and service uh, in our target markets. So we're gonna be ramping up both of those. So contrary to layoffs, no, actually it's uh, more hiring. What about location? People are Afraid yeah. that this is moving, that there was a lot of media coverage about a guarantee for one year, and everybody assumes that means that after a year. Yeah, so you know, Vista has a, has, you know, a track record of moving businesses to cheaper locations. So Vista has in the past moved businesses. They moved a business that was here, uh, Shopatron, um, to uh, to Texas, and uh, Shopatron was a much smaller company than we are, and you know, it's interesting when you talk to Vista. One thing that's really distinctive about them is. You might expect a certain amount of cocky self-confidence or arrogance. That's not how they behave at all. In fact, the, one, of their, one of their mantras is, uh, don't be a know-it-all, be a learn-it-all. Like they're constantly learning. So one of the things that they've said to us candidly is they said, you know, we have moved companies before because, they, because with, with the Shopatron purchase, they actually bought two other companies and combined them into what's called Kibo today. And when you look at the overall strategy they're doing with Kibo, that's probably going to going to turn out quite well. Um, so there was a, a reason why they needed to pull the companies together. Um, but they've also said they've had cases where they moved companies where it really wasn't worth it. It didn't, it didn't work out well. And with regard to San Luis Obispo, they're really impressed with Slow. They're impressed with the university. They're impressed with the quality of life. They're impressed with the talent that we've been able to assemble. You know, it's 950 people here on Tank Farm and Broad and more than 100 people in Santa Maria. And when you look at it in aggregate, and you look at the cost of living from North Santa Barbara County to Paso, it's actually not bad. In fact, I defy anyone to tell me any place on the Pacific coast of the United States. In fact, let's go up to uh, British Columbia. Show me a place where there's meaningful jobs, where it's cheaper to live than it is here. And uh, I know we don't feel that way sometimes, you know. Uh, and the city is slow, is expensive. And if you want a view of the Pacific Ocean, that's expensive. But there are also plenty of bedroom communities that are within commutable distance where you can have the three-bedroom, two-bath house in a backyard for a very reasonable price. And so relative to that, they look at our cost of living and they say, this is a great place to build a company. In fact, kudos, Rick, what a great choice. You know, being here in Slow and staying in Slow went from being an odd choice to being somehow perceived as brilliant uh, kind of overnight. And I sort of laugh at both. You know, it's, it's neither odd or brilliant, it's just a choice that we made. And the resources of this community are the talent, uh, the university, and the quality of life. And so I don't see that changing. I think we have a really bright future on the Central Coast. How much concern have the employees been expressing? Well, with the, the initial audience, uh, announcement, there was, of course, a great deal of concern. And uh, I had to you know, just even announcing it on Christmas Eve, I mean, a lot of people were on, were on vacation. And so uh, we, we realized with this unfortunate timing, and we didn't plan it that way. It just worked out that way. You know, when you have an offer on the table, it's like you're selling your house. You, if you're going to wait, that's, that's a quite a decision, isn't it? I mean, you have to make a decision, and you have to weigh all the things. And the board and I decided unanimously, I mean, all eight of us said, this is the right offer to take and we, need, and we should do it now. And uh, so we knew when we were signing the deal on the weekend of the 22nd and 23rd of December, per SEC regulation, we had to announce it on the next business day, on December 24th, which by the way was in the middle of a government shutdown. Um, it's the strangest time. And so the, the, the team members of my body had a number of concerns. And so the first thing that we did is we had an all hands meeting uh, I did two all-hands meetings on December 24th to announce it across the world to our team, who, the ones who were accessible. And then a week later, I wrote an, I, uh, an email to everyone answering more questions about it. The number one question that people had for me on the team was, 
did you want this? Like they wanted to know whether I'd been pushed into it or pressured, and uh, I had not. In fact, quite the contrary. I felt this was the right move for the company. And um, for most of our team members, that was what they needed to hear, that I actually believed in it, that contrary to being pushed into it, I actually had led, um, uh, I am the chairman of the board of directors, so I, I, had, I had led the board in the conversation, and then the board considered it objectively as independent directors, and that's their job. They don't, they don't take direction from me, quite the contrary. They had listened, and then they had said, yes, that makes sense to us. And they had asked me all the hard questions about it, too. Will you be on the new board? Yes. And you're the only one, though, that will be? Uh, the only independent. So the, board, the new board is, is immediately as a formation. The, the, I'm no longer the chairman. The chairman of the Mind Body Board of Directors is Robert L. Smith. He's the uh, chairman and founder of Vista Equity Partners, a remarkable man. Uh, in fact, I invite people to, to look him up. Robert Smith, Vista. Uh, there's a really great YouTube video about him, an interview on Bloomberg. He's a guy who doesn't get in front of the camera that often, um, but when he does, he's, he's amazing. And uh, I think a, a, uh, quite an inspiration to other software executives like me. Yeah. I have to ask this question. Hold, uh, that, hold that question up there, half a second. Oh, so, so while he's doing that, I'll ask you the question, then you can be responding. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, there, there are going to be people in the community who are, who are going to say this is about, you know, taking some capital back out of the business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, was it about taking capital out of the business? No, no. But so, so are you ready? Yeah. Are we on? I'm still rolling. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, no, that was not a primary concern of mine, taking capital out. Um, it's true as a public CEO, I'm pretty severely restricted on my ability to sell my own stock, and the vast majority of my net worth is locked up in mind-body stock. The stock, by the way, that I earned by building the company, and so there were, there were some media reports that were implying that this was somehow a, uh, a payday for me. Uh, no, th this is actually me selling a significant portion of my ownership in the company, but that wasn't the driving point for me. The driving point for me was, is this, a first and foremost, a good outcome for all the shareholders of the company? And uh, in speaking as a significant shareholder who has invested 20 years of my life and everything else I had into this company, I felt pretty strongly that it was. Um, and secondly, that it's setting the company up and the employees and our customers for a, bright, a brighter future. It needed to satisfy both in my mind to be uh, to something that I would vote for. But to be perfectly candid, once you set something like this in motion as a, uh, a board of directors, at the end of the day, it's a publicly held company and the board's job is to represent the interest of the shareholders and the, bo the board's most important decision is this the right thing for our shareholders. And that's why it is possible that I could have voted against it and it still passed. And, and it could have. And at the end of the day, I satisfied myself that it met the two criteria. So, I, I'm trying to figure out a way to ask this question. Um, talk to me a little bit about, and, and sort of help the employees and the community at large, because the community was mm -hmm. at least afraid that some of these bigger companies would be moving out of the area. Yeah. That, you, you know, what was, what was behind your decision? And you did take a risk, in a sense, by offering it up or, or, or entertaining offers to the company. Yeah. You took a risk. You know, what, like, tell me the <coughs> driving force behind, you know, what you were trying to accomplish. Well, let's all remember that we are, not an in, we are not in control of the company. We being me, the founders, the board really is not in control of the company. The shareholders control the company. <coughs> As a public company, we had thousands of shareholders and hundreds of significant mutual funds and hedge funds any of whom could increase their stake at any time or decrease their stake at any time. And so actually the people controlling the company are maybe 50 shareholders who aren't people that, you know, it's not like we went out and vetted them and said, hey, uh, do you match our values? Do you really have the long-term interest of the company at heart? No, these guys are making bets on whether they can make money. So that's the nature of being a public company. So as the founder and CEO of the company, 
it's, in, it's incumbent upon me to, to look at that and say, who are these people that, that own the company? Do they have our long-term interests at heart? And you're never 100% assured of that. And there are many cases of activist shareholders coming in and exerting significant pressure on, on boards, particularly companies that have hit some rocky patches where people, there are shareholders are saying, listen, I think uh, you're not doing this well. You should do it a different way. So the notion that staying public would have been the way to assure that everything stays the same at MindBody is, is far from the truth. Uh, the decision of MindBody to have its headquarters in San Luis Obispo has to be predicated on that this is the best place to run the business from, to run this global enterprise that's serving customers in over 90 countries. It is, in my view and in the view of our current shareholders, Vista Equity Partners, the best place for the headquarters of the company. But not entertaining outside offers it was not a way to maintain control. Uh, you can have hostile takeovers of public companies, particularly when they're undervalued and we were undervalued. So two final questions for you. Number one, what are you, ex what are you most excited about? Uh, I, I mean, I think people are going to be really reassured that, you know, that you've sort of accepted to, to be the CEO or offered that position again, you're going to stay here. Yeah. So what are you most excited about moving forward under this new? I'm excited about, first and foremost, being part of this larger group of really excellent software company operators. I went to, the, to Vista's CEO summit uh, a few weeks back and got to spend time with uh, over 50 software CEOs that are in the Vista family. And to a person, I found them to be inspiring and interesting, people I connected to. Most of them are entrepreneurs. Um, and we now have the freedom, now that we are, the deal is closed, to share information openly. And that's something you can't do as a public company. There is a very strict rules of confidentiality and veils around public companies and information that you share has to be shared with everybody. Um, and so I'm excited to be able to compare notes with peers that can teach me a lot. I also am excited about the fact that, that Vista is a learning organization and they want to learn from us. They're particularly impressed with our culture. They're impressed with our core values. They're impressed with the purpose of the company. And it's deeply meaningful to them that, that in the process of investing in us, they're helping a good cause. They're helping improve health and wellness. And that may sound a little like a throwaway statement. It's, not, it's truly exciting to them to be part of this. And of course, they expect to make money doing it as well, like anyone else investing in a business. Um, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the ability to make longer term decisions that we can make carefully considered investments now that will accelerate the future of the business in 2020, 2021, 2022. You always try to think that way. I mean, it's your job to think that way as a CEO. As a public company, it's not always easy because you have to be willing to sacrifice some bottom line in the near term for a greater outcome in the future. What are you most concerned about? Ah, <laughs> uh, what am I concerned about? Well, I mean, I, the things I'm concerned about are the same things I've always been concerned about, and that is mind body remaining a vibrant uh, presence in the marketplace. We're not the only ones doing this. We have competition, um, and we have competitors that, that run at us every day. And we have to continue to up our game. We have to be better in our products. We have to be better in how we take care of our customers. Um, also, I'm concerned about the economy of, of the world. You know, that's another thing I had to think about was, you know, we've had a long, good run here in the economy uh, for many years. Lots of people are saying there's probably a downturn coming. I certainly hope there isn't, but there probably is. And so I'm concerned about the ramifications of uh, economic setbacks. And that was part of what the board had to think about was, if we don't accept this offer, what's the prospect that the company is worth more in the next three years? than $36.50 a share. And the truthful answer we came to was probably low. That long term, we believe this is gonna be a very meaningful and valuable company, but we don't know what, what's in store for the next three to five years. And I think all of us can, can connect to this, that it's, it's kind of a weird time right now. You know, are we gonna be in a trade war with China? Um, is there some war gonna pop up? You know, I, um, I'm a pretty positive person by nature. But I concern myself with that. Um, I'm concerned about Brexit. Brexit is, is just really unfortunate. If the UK actually does this, 
It's going to cause deep ripples, not just in Europe, but in the global economy. And Europe is an important mark to it, market to us. We have offices in, in the UK. Um, so these are all external things. These are macro things. These really aren't much about uh, what's going on internally. And those concerns existed whether we were public or private. The difference now is that near-term troubles don't take the value of the company and, and slam it and get it cut in half or 70% down. We've lost more than half of our value from our peak earlier this year, or earlier, excuse me, a year ago, um, to where we were on December 21st. And that's hard for a team when you've worked so hard, and this team works so hard to, to every day, day in and day out, to serve our customers, to, to make better product, to bring it to market, to see the value of the thing that you built. And for most of our MindBody team members, they also had MindBody stock. As by the way, uh, most of the MindBody team actually had an opportunity to sell their stock as well at a really nice price. And I'm really happy for them. Many of them, are, people are buying houses. People are paying off student debt. Um, so many people have written me letters of thanks for doing this. Uh, we now get to, it's kind of like pulling the ship in, and I'm a Navy guy, so you've got to forgive the metaphors. It's pulling the ship out of stormy waters into a nice safe harbor where we can carefully and methodically work on that ship and improve it without being so worried about how hard the wind is blowing out there. So I've had one more question. How long do you want to see, see yourself being involved in this company? Uh, I'm going to continue serving the company on two criteria. Number one, that I am effective in my job. That, um, and you know, I'm probably I'm probably my own toughest critic. And as long as it's clear to me that I'm doing a good job for the MindBody team and MindBody shareholders and our customers, then that's number one. Number two is that I'm having fun doing it. I can tell you right now, I'm a lot more excited and happier <laughs> about the future, the next few years of the company than I was uh, two months ago. And uh, because I was seeing you know, storm clouds that were quite concerning and we had a lot of challenges to deal with. We have some of the same challenges today, but we can do it now in a safer environment. And uh, so um, I think at least several years. All right, thank you. Anything sure. else you wanna add, uh, anything else to do with them? We love the Central Coast. <laughs> That's what they want to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not moving, man. We just finished, and we finally moved back from. We were in. My wife and I were in Tascadero for for ten years, and uh, love a Tascadero. Finally moved back to San Luis Obispo um, last summer, and finished a house remodel in near downtown. And we love our neighbors. We love our neighborhood. We love Slow Town. Uh, in any given weekend, you'll probably find us somewhere downtown enjoying the amenities. We're not going anywhere. <laughs>